Welcome to this lecture. Today we shall discuss the realm of the galaxies. One of the outstanding questions at the dawn of the 20th century concerned the size of our galaxy, indeed the size of our universe. One of the astronomers who addressed this question head on was the famous Dutch astronomer Captain What he did was to measure the position of bright stars in the galaxy and he plotted them and that's what you see in this figure Captain plotted the distribution of stars to him this represented a map of our galaxy indeed a map of the universe the galaxy and the universe was rather small it was only about 60000 light years across and it seemed somewhat flattened in the vertical direction most disturbingly the sun was at the center of the galaxy in 1922 captain did not know that there was a lot of dust in the galaxy which caused severe extinction of starlight and therefore he did not know that he was seeing only the nearby bright stars another question which was hotly debated at the beginning of the 20th century was the following is our galaxy synonymous with the universe in other words are there any other galaxies besides our own this question was debated in public fora for example on the 26th of april 1920 two famous astronomers arlo shapley and heber curtis debated this question in the smithsonian museum of natural history and the debate concerned the following question namely what is the nature of the large number of spiral nebulae we see in our galaxy and what is the size of our universe one of the most famous spiral nebula in the sky is the nebula the great nebula in the constellation of andromeda the question was is this great spiral nebula part of our galaxy or is it a distant galaxy in its own right this question was soon settled but before i tell you how it was done i must digress a little bit there are some stars known as variable stars two of them are named here cepheids this is one kind of variable stars and rr lyrae is another kind of variable star the distinct feature of a variable star is that its brightness varies periodically with time like a clock of course the period of variation de depends on which star you are discussing the important thing to appreciate is that their apparent brightness the brightness that we the intensity that we measure varies periodically a great discovery was made by henrietta levitt around 1908 she was studying variable stars such as shown in the figure over here and this is what she discovered it turned out that there are some variable stars cepheids and aurora lyrae to which the distances could be measured using standard astronomical techniques therefore from the apparent brightness or the intensity that we measure she was able to calculate the intrinsic brightness or the luminosity of these stars because we know the distance and so what she plotted was on the y axis 
the luminosity of these variable stars, and on the x-axis, she plotted the period of variation of the light intensity. And lo and behold, she found a linear relationship, a linear relationship between the luminosity of these variable stars and the period of the variation. She discovered that the luminosity of these stars is proportional to the period of their variability. So there is a beautiful linear relation. These are the cepheids. There are two kinds of cepheids, cepheid 1 and cepheid 2, but we won't bother about that. And then, the, then there are the RR Lyrae stars. This was an extremely important discovery in the history of astronomy. Now, if I now look at a cepheid variable or an RR Lyrae star, whose, to which I do not know the distance, what I measure is its apparent brightness. But because I know its period of light variation, I know what its luminosity ought to be. Since I know the apparent brightness and the intrinsic brightness of the luminosity, I can deduce the distance. Imagine a distant street lamp. You don't know the distance to the street lamp. Therefore, you don't know whether it's a 500 watt sodium vapor lamp or a 50 watt sodium vapor lamp. What you do know is the intensity that you measure many kilometers away. But suppose the star, the street light was variable, and by using this relation that Henrietta Leavitt had discovered, I can deduce that it was actually a 500 watt sodium vapor lamp, then from the measured intensity, which decreases as 1 over r squared, I can calculate the distance to the street lamp. It is as simple as that. Therefore, from the apparent brightness, which is what we measure, and since we know the luminosity through the period luminosity relation, the distance to these stars can be accurately determined. Now, why is this so important? This became important for the following reason. Around 1923, Edwin Hubble, a famous astronomer working in California, discovered one such cepheid variable in the Andromeda Nebula. And therefore, using the technique that I just elaborated, he was able to deduce the distance to the Andromeda Nebula. And he was able to establish with great accuracy that the Andromeda Nebula was at a distance of 3 million light years from us. Since our galaxy is only about 100,000 light years across, clearly the Andromeda Nebula must be a galaxy in its own right. Very soon, Edwin Hubble published a classic book entitled The Realm of the Nebulae, in which he explored the morphology of galaxies. And here is an important classification that he offered in his book. He said there are two kinds of galaxies, elliptical galaxies and spiral galaxies. Not only that, he argued that the spiral galaxies are of two types, the upper fork and the lower fork. What distinguishes the galaxy, spiral galaxies in the upper fork from those in the lower fork is the following. For galaxies in the upper fork, SA type, SB, SC, and so on, the spiral arms start from the very center central region of the central bulge of the galaxy. Whereas for the spiral galaxies, which are shown in the bottom, the spiral arms start at the end of a bar. So here is a bar in the central region of the galaxy, and the spiral arms clearly start from at the end of the spiral arms. So this capital B stands for bar. 
So there are two kinds of spiral arms. Spiral arms without spiral galaxies, without central bars, and spiral galaxies with central bars. And then there are the elliptical galaxies, and we shall come to that a little later. Now, what is the distinguishing feature from, of these two kinds of spirals? I've already referred to the fact that the spirals in the upper arm, the spiral arms start from the central bulge. On the other hand, for the spirals in the lower arm of the fork, the spiral arms have start with the center, at the end of the central bar. Now here are some of the spiral galaxies in the upper branch, SA, SB, SC, and here are the, some sample galaxies in the lower arm of the, of, the, of the fork, those with bars. You can see the bar very clearly. Now let us look at some spectacular images of spiral galaxies. So, spiral galaxies, regardless of whether they have a central bar or not, have a central bulge. And this bulge consists of old stars. There is the bulge. And then there is a flattened disk. Here is an edge-on view of the flattened disk. And this disk consists not only of stars, but it also consists of gas, and dust. You notice that the color of the light from the central bulge is yellowish, indicating that these are old stars with the surface temperature which is rather low. Whereas the bright nebulae and the bright blue stars that trace out the spiral arms are very different. They are relatively young objects and gas which has not yet been converted to stars. Now, there is also dust in the spiral arms and that can be seen more easily in the edge-on galaxy where the dust is seen as a dark lane. That is all dust. The spiral galaxies are subclassified according to the tightness of the spiral, clumpiness of the spiral arms, and the size of the central bulge, because these three characteristics tell us something extremely important about the galaxy. And these differences can be traced back to the relative amounts of gas and dust in the galaxy under consideration. What fraction of the mass of the galaxy is in stars and what fraction of the mass of the galaxy is in the form of gas and dust? Now let us first consider the spiral galaxies of the type SA. I shall remind you in a minute what they look like. But please note that in these SA spirals, only total 2% of the total mass of the galaxy is in the form of star I mean, uh, gas and dust, only 2%, a very small percentage. This in turn means that there is relatively a small portion of the galaxy that is involved in active star formation today. Thus, the spirals of the type SA are dominated by the large bulges of the old stars. Stated differently, what this means is the following. In order to have active star formation, you need gas. It is the collapse of the gas clouds that results in the formation of stars. And since only 2% of the total mass of the galaxy is in the form of gas and dust, there is very little star formation. Therefore, the galaxy is dominated by the central spheroidal bulge, which consists essentially of very old stars. So what we're saying is that this, spiral, this type of spiral galaxy, SA, essentially is dominated by the central bulge, 
which you can clearly see in this beautiful image that I am indicating with my cursor. Now let us consider spirals of the type SC at the other end of the upper fold. Now these spirals contain 15% of gas and dust and not 2% as in SA types. Thus, relatively, a large portion of the galaxy is involved in active star formation. For this reason, these galaxies are not dominated by the central bulge. Indeed, SC spirals have a rather small bulge. They are dominated by loosely wound up spiral arms that can be resolved into clumps of newly formed massive blue stars and ionized hydrogen clouds, ionized by the ultraviolet radiation from these newly formed uh, bright blue stars. So, these galaxies, SC type, you see, are dominated by spectacular spirals. The central bulge is not very dominant. And these spiral arms are delineated by nebulae, ionized gas shining in recombination radiation, as well as clumps of newly formed clusters of blue, massive, bright stars. Some of these spiral galaxies are small, while others are very large with sizes as large as 100,000 or 300,000 light years across. Their masses range from about 10 to the power 9 to 10 to the power 12 solar masses. Their luminosities also cover a very vast range from about 10 to the power 8 to 10 to the power 11 solar luminosity. All spiral galaxies rotate. Indeed, they are rotationally supported. As we shall see, the spiral galaxies are embedded in a giant halo of dark matter. This we shall discuss in the next lecture. In today's universe, spiral galaxies make up roughly 60% of the population of galaxies. They are mainly found in low-density regions of the universe. They are seldom found near the centers of clusters of galaxies. So these are the characteristics of spiral galaxies. Now let us turn our attention briefly to elliptical galaxies. Elliptical galaxies were classified by Hubble as E0, E3, E5, E7, SO, and so on. The important thing to appreciate is that unlike spirals, elliptical galaxies are not supported by mass rotation. The orbits of stars in elliptical galaxies are random, elongated, and elliptical, like the pictures we make of electrons orbiting the nucleus in a bohr summerfell model of the atom, elliptically, elliptical orbits. And indeed, it is the elongated elliptical orbits that give the ellipsoidal shape to these galaxies. Now, the size of elliptical galaxies is measured in terms of an effective radius. And the effective radius is a circle which encompasses roughly 60% of the light from the galaxy. So, that is the effective radius of the galaxy. 60% of the light comes from the galaxy. Some of the elliptical galaxies are extremely massive with masses of the order of 10 to the power 12 solar mass. And they are found mainly near the centers of clusters of galaxies where spiral galaxies are seldom found. And these elliptical galaxies, as I said, contain up to 10 to the power 13 solar masses and are believed to have been formed by the merger of galaxies through galaxy-galaxy collision. We shall discuss this towards the end of the series of lectures. 
Elliptical galaxies, unlike spiral galaxies, contain very little gas and dust. All the gas and dust has already been converted to stars, and all the massive stars have evolved and died, producing neutron stars and black holes. And there are the only stars that remain are very old stars, which have still not evolved. In the present universe, therefore, there is very little star formation in elliptical galaxies because there is very little mass uh, in gas and dust. As I said, they contain mostly old red stars, what we shall call very soon as population two stars. So elliptical galaxies contain mostly old stars like the bulges of spiral galaxies contain very old stars. Not surprisingly, elliptical galaxies, we do not find explosions of massive stars. For example, in spiral galaxies like our own, every once in 25 years, a massive star explodes as a supernova explosion. Such events do not occur in elliptical galaxies because all the massive stars have evolved and exploded long ago. This is perhaps the most famous of the elliptical galaxies, the giant elliptical galaxy M87 at the center of the Virgo cluster of galaxies. In 2019, this remarkable image was made of the shadow of the central black hole whose mass is roughly a billion times the mass of the sun. Emanating from this central supermassive black hole is a powerful jet which can be seen in visible light, radio wavelengths and x-rays. And this relativistic jets, namely particles are moving at the very nearly at the speed of light, extends to tens of thousands of light years. So we shall discuss such active galaxies a little later in this course of lectures. Now we turn our attention to our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. A spectacular breakthrough was made by the Harvard astronomer Harlow Shapley. What he did was to use the great discovery that Henrietta Leavitt had made in 1908, which I already referred to, but let's state it once again. Her discovery that the luminosities of Cepheids and RR Lyrae stars is directly proportional to the period of their variability enables us to determine the distances to RR Lyrae and Cepheid variables. It is by using one of these Cepheid variables in the great spiral nebula in Andromeda that Hubble was able to determine the distance to the Andromeda nebula. In a similar fashion, but earlier, in 1917, the Harvard astronomer Harlow Shapley used RR Lyrae stars to determine the distances to about 140 globular clusters such as this. A typical globular cluster consists of roughly a million stars bound together by mutual gravity, and the stars are in elliptical orbits, like in an elliptical galaxy or like in the bulge of uh, spiral galaxies. And what Harlow Shapley was able to do was to measure the distances to a very large number of globular clusters in our galaxy, and he plotted them. And that's what is shown here. There is the sun, and this is the distribution of the globular clusters that uh, Harlow Shapley measured. Remember, he could determine the distances, therefore he could actually make a map of the distribution of globular clusters. And that cross there is the dynamical center of the globular clusters. In other words, the globular clusters are going around in the stars inside the globular clusters are in elliptical orbit, but the globular clusters themselves 
are going around in elliptical orbits around the center of our galaxy, and that is the dynamical center. What is important to appreciate is that the dynamical center of the distribution of globular clusters is not the sun, but quite far away. And therefore, globular, therefore Harlow Shapley identified this dynamical center as the center of our Milky Way galaxy, and the following picture emerged of our own galaxy. There is a thin disk of stars and dust. There is a central bulge. And the sun is no longer at the center of our galaxy. It's roughly about 30,000 light years across from the, from the center of the galaxy. And these dots that you see are the globular clusters. Notice that the globular clusters are all located well away from the plane of the galaxy where the gas and dust is concentrated. Therefore, when you look away from the plane of the galaxy, there is very little extinction of light because there is not much path length through gas and dust. Therefore, you can see almost every globular cluster there is in our galaxy even though it may be practically at the other end of the galaxy. But you couldn't do that with stars because the bright stars are all confined to the disk of the galaxy, as we shall now emphasize. And those stars suffer from extinction. And that is why Captain could not see uh, properly uh, the distant stars and therefore concluded erroneously about the size and the geometry of our galaxy. Now, this is what our galaxy looks like when you look straight towards the center of the galaxy. So it's like an ant on a pancake or a dosa looking towards the center of the galaxy. It cannot see very far because there's a lot of molecular clouds and dust in the plane of the galaxy. And that explains the dark band that you see over here. These stars, apparently well away from the plane of the galaxy, are really in the plane of the galaxy. They appear to be well away simply because they are extremely close to us. Here is a spectacular picture of the Milky Way, as we call it, taken with an iPhone, believe it or not. So I would like to use this image to make a few points. Here, once again, we are looking straight towards the center of our galaxy along the disk of the galaxy. The dark band that you see, like you saw in the previous slide, is due to giant molecular clouds, which consist mostly of dust and molecular hydrogen. And that is the plane of our galaxy. The dotted line is the plane of our galaxy. And most of the bright stars, the newly formed blue massive stars, are close to the plane of the galaxy and therefore they suffer very severe extinction. Globular clusters are way away, away from the plane of the galaxy and therefore do not suffer much extinction. And that is why Harlow Shapley was able to map the entire distribution of globular clusters in our galaxy. Here is once again looking straight towards the center of our galaxy, along the plane of the galaxy, but not in visible light, but in infrared. And there you see, in infrared, it is glowing very nicely. That is because dust emits radiation in the infrared. And of course, you see the bulge stars and other stars, which we shall discuss presently, because they are old stars, their black body spectrum peaks uh, well below 5,000 degrees and therefore they are very bright in the infrared and not so bright in the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum. So here is another view of our galaxy. There is the central bulge. That is the thin galactic disk which consists of gas, dust and newly formed bright young stars. 
and way outside the plane of the galaxy or the globular clusters, and that is the halo of the galaxy, which consists of globular clusters and other objects which we shall refer to presently. Now let us consider the stars in the disk of the galaxy. As I said, spiral galaxies rotate, therefore planets, just like planets in our solar system, all stars and all gas clouds have to go around the center of the galaxy. And they go around in circular orbits. But please remember that the galaxy is not an infinitesimally thin disk. It has a certain thickness and therefore there is a certain mass. Therefore, stars also oscillate about the plane of the galaxy in simple harmonic motion. Therefore, the stars in the disk of the galaxy execute motion like this. They go around the center of the galaxy in circular orbits, but they also execute simple harmonic oscillation about the plane of the galaxy. That's what is written over here. Whereas the stars in the bulge of the galaxy and in the halo of the galaxy are in elliptical orbits, as I already said. Now let us look at the disk of the galaxy. The disk of the galaxy, which is roughly circular, consists of a thin disk of stars. And this disk rotates about the galactic center. The luminosity of this star disk is roughly 2 times 10 to the power 10 solar luminosity and the mass is roughly 6 times 10 to the power 9 solar masses. This is the mass in stars which are confined to the thin disk. Now the disk extends up to 15 kiloparsec, 15,000 parsec or 45,000 light years from the center of the galaxy. Now, as you go away from the center of the galaxy in the plane of the galaxy or perpendicular to the plane of the galaxy, the density of stars decreases exponentially both radially and vertically just as the density of our atmosphere decreases as you go further up from the surface of the Earth. Now, the number density of stars decreases exponentially as e to the power minus r over a certain scale factor h. In other words, if you go a distance h subscript r, the number decreases to 1 over the exponential. Now, in the disk of the galaxy, the scale length is roughly 3 kiloparsecs or 3000 parsecs or roughly 9,000 light years. So in other words, just around where the sun is located with respect to the center of the galaxy, the number of stars decreases to 1 over e of the number of stars towards the center of the galaxy. Now most of these stars, 90% of them, lie in a thin disk with a vertical scale height, which is only some 300 parsecs which is very, very small. Now the rest of the 5% of the stars form a very thick disk, very thick disk, with a vertical scale height of almost one kiloparsec. The disk stars in the thin disk are very young, newly formed stars. And the stars in the thick disk are very old stars. Now there is also a gas disk which is even thinner than the thin disk of stars. So let us, Chinese saying, one picture is worth 10,000 words. So that 5% of the stars in our galaxy are in a thick disk whose scale height is roughly about a kiloparsec in this direction. And then there is a thin disk of stars thin relative to this thick disk of stars, and 90% of the stars are in this thin disk. 
and it, there is an even thinner gas disk and dust of course is associated with gas so that's the sort of morphology of our spiral gal the spiral galaxy in which we live in now let's look at the central bulge of our galaxy it is spheroidal in shape and consists mostly of very old stars very old stellar population the luminosity of the bulge is roughly 5 times 10 to the power 9 solar luminosities and the mass of the bulge is less than the mass of the stars in the disk it's about 2 times 10 to the power 10 solar masses the galactic center there is the sun the galactic center which is over there is roughly 8 kiloparsec from the sun and the bulge is a few kiloparsec in radius so that is about 1 kiloparsec in radius and we are what 8 kiloparsec from the center of the galaxy now in addition to the thin disk of gas and the thin disk of stars and the thick disk of stars there is also a halo of the galaxy which extend to very great distances now this halo consists of field stars whose total mass is roughly 10 to the power 9 solar masses they are all very very old stars they are metal poor astronomers have very strange notations and nomenclatures metal poor simply metal is anything heavier than helium what it means is most of the stars in the halo like the stars in the uh, thick disk of the galaxy consists essentially of hydrogen and helium we do not detect very much of heavier elements in it they are in random motion in elliptical orbits and uh, around the center of the galaxy then of course there are the globular clusters which we referred to a while ago and they constitute only a few percent of the total halo uh, total stellar content in the halo but remember each globular cluster contains about roughly a million stars and there are about 140 globular clusters in our galaxy in addition to all these stellar populations there is also gas in the disk i mean in the halo of the galaxy extending to very great distances from the visible part of the galaxy now this gas is extremely hot it's at a temperature about a million degrees it is because the temperature is about a million degrees it is able to escape from the gravity of the galactic stellar population and bloat up to very great heights please remember that in our atmosphere the density of atoms and molecules in the atmosphere is given by a boltzmann distribution exponential to the power mgh divided by kt where mgh is the potential energy and kt is the thermal energy therefore if you want a uh, molecules and atoms to extend to very great height in the atmosphere then the gas must have a very great temperature in a similar fashion unless the gas is at a temperature of about a million degrees it will not extend to very great distances gravity will pull it down do we know of such gas at million degrees of course we know the corona of the sun which you see during a total solar eclipse consists of gas which is at a temperature of about a million degrees and therefore this gas and sim- gas at similar temperature in the galaxy is known as coronal gas in an al- analogy with the gas that we find in the corona of the sun its temperature is roughly a million degrees and its characteristic radiation will be mostly in the far ultraviolet and in soft x rays a gas at a temperature of about a million degrees the black body spectrum will peak in soft x rays and then of course there is a dark matter whose physical nature is absolutely unknown but what is relevant and we shall discuss this in the next lecture is that 90% of the matter mass in our galaxy 
is in a totally unknown form. It is in the form of dark matter, whatever that might be. Walter Barre, whose name we will encounter prominently in the coming lectures, an astronomer working at the California Institute of Technology, divided stars into two populations, population one and population two stars. This division is on the basis of the abundance of heavy elements in the stars. Population one stars have heavy elements in them. Whereas population two stars are mostly hydrogen and helium, there is very little heavy element. And this population also correlates with the age and type of galaxy in which they are found. Let us first look at population one stars. Population one stars are metal rich stars, meaning they have elements heavier than hydrogen, calcium, oxygen, magnesium, silicon, sulfur, and so on. And they contain about two to three percent of heavier element. Even these stars are mostly made up of hydrogen and helium, but they, we do find the heavier elements in them, in, this, in their spectra. Now, as I said, metals are any element heavier than helium, as far as astronomers are concerned. And these metal-rich stars, the population one stars, are found mainly in the thin disk of stars in the galaxy that I referred to. They travel in circular orbits, and generally remain in the plane of the galaxy, but they can also oscillate about the plane of the galaxy in simple harmonic motion. Now, the older fraction of the population one stars are found a little farther away from the younger of the population one stars. Now, Population 1 stars are relatively young stars which have been formed very recently, perhaps as recently as just a billion years ago, and some of them just a few tens of millions of years ago. Now, there are two kinds of population 1 stars. There is an extreme population 1 stars, which are uh, the most metal-rich stars. They are found only in the disk of the galaxy and they are confined to the spiral arms of the galaxy. Then there is the intermediate population one star, like our own sun, and these are located throughout the galaxy, not just confined to the spiral arms of the galaxy. Now, let us turn to population two stars. These are metal-poor stars, and they contain mostly, at most, 0.1% of heavy elements. They are found in the spheroidal component of the bulge of the galaxy and also in the halo of the galaxy. They have randomly tipped elliptical orbits which can plunge through the disk of the galaxy. It has to plunge through the disk of the galaxy during their elliptical motion around the center of the galaxy. And they can go up to very large distances from the center of the galaxy. They are all relatively old stars with ages ranging from 2 to 14 billion years. In other words, some of them are as old as the universe itself. Now, similar to population 1 stars, population 2 stars can also be divided into extreme population, which is the most metal poor, and an intermediate population 2 which are located in the bulge of the galaxy. And they are also, they, they, they are slightly more metal rich than the extreme population two stars. In other words, I'm saying that the stars in the halo of the galaxy are even more metal poor than the stars in the bulge of the galaxy. That's because they are even older. So let us summarize. That is the halo of our galaxy. The halo of the galaxy consists of field stars, which are as, almost as old as our universe. They are in elliptical motion around the center of the galaxy. There are globular clusters in the halo. And then there is coronal gas at a temperature of a million degrees. These are the constituents of the halo of the galaxy. Then there is a thin disk 
of the galaxy, which consists of population one stars, which are metal rich. In other words, they have heavy elements in their spectrum. And they are more recently formed. The extreme population one stars are formed just in the last 10 or 15 million years ago. Then there is the gas disk at the very center of this vertical distribution. So that concludes uh, our brief review of the nature of the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy is a spiral galaxy. All spiral galaxies rotate. Indeed, they are rotationally supported, like the planets in the solar system are rotationally supported. If they didn't go around, they'll fall into the sun. What is the law of rotation? Does the galaxy rotate like the planets in the solar system with different angular velocities at different distances? Or does it rotate rigidly like a compact disk that you use to listen to music? So that will be the subject of the next lecture, which will be on the rotation of our galaxy and how we deduce the law of rotation of our galaxy. Thank you very much.